for those that can't be here. But I already have a GitHub repository um, set up for the reading of this book. And um, Finn and Hermann uh, are going to um, take turns um, giving a little presentation of chapters three and four, which are the first chapters with code. Uh, and there are some problems scattered throughout the book. Uh, I can't remember how much they come in into chapters three and four. I'm very familiar with the first edition of this book, and I've been excited to read the second edition. So this is a nice opportunity for me and hopefully interesting for you guys too. I thought what I would do next time is uh, I'll just cover some of the aspects of um, chapters one and two. You'll get the most out of this if you read the chapters. And uh, maybe we can use the time in the meetings to go through some of the code. And if I recall correctly, I think um, one of the chapters, maybe chapter two uh, in this book, is just an intro to our um, chapter. And so um, I'll probably introduce the ideas that are introduced in chapter one, some of the big ideas in spatial ecology and the state of the art in statistical analysis of spatial data. I'll do the presentation next week, uh, even though I'm also doing it this week. It's fine. But then after that, um, uh, you guys will take one. And I think um, Herman told me that you have an, another prior engagement next week, and that's fine. We'll record it, and you can catch up later. That's no problem. And so you guys can decide which one of you would like to go first. Now, for all of us, this is something that's just nice to read, and we've read books uh, in here before, like the one re George recently did. And further back, uh, I've gone through some more traditional statistics texts using R with you guys. This is something a bit different. It's very modern. It's um, relevant to a lot of you. And uh, this one is also tied to um, to a module that uh, Finn and Herman are going through. But uh, it's of interest, I know, to Joe and some other people too. So um, should be should be good. What I think we're going to do after that is uh, I'm doing some traveling personally, and uh, unless somebody steps forward um, and wants to uh, lead them in my absence, I know a few of us will be traveling. Uh, I'll be gone and unavailable for about four weeks at least. But at some point, uh, let's just take a break. I think. Unless somebody really wants to come in and keep it keep it rolling over, any anyone could volunteer. You don't have to have any special skills. So if you'd like to try to do that, just yell, and I'll I'll populate a few topics. <clears throat> Otherwise, we'll take a spring break and we'll come back. I think everything is caught up on the chapters, including YouTube videos. Uh, so the videos we're making here, uh, you can just watch them anytime. And I think all the resources that I have are um, are up and and gone. OK, keep keep me. Um, remind me of that, George, and you're on for the 25th. You'll be back, but I'll still be I'll still be gone then. So if you want to pick that up, I'll also be gone the week after that. So I was thinking of taking a four week break. But if you want to volunteer for one date and do stuff, that is great. Just remind me of that and I'll put you on the calendar. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, break. Yeah, I think this time in the summer, it's the uh, planting season and people are launching growing experiments. It is it does make sense to make a break, but but if people want to go for it, I'm, I'm all for that. I like to see that. All right. What are we going to do today? Well, what we're going to do today is um, I thought that I would um, show you how to set up the project. Now, uh, I used to go through this a lot with you guys. I'm just going to drag this over into this window. I used to go through the setting up of projects quite a lot, and I focused um, for the first times that I've done this, and recently I focused on uh, essentially the elements of setting up a, a very simple project. So simple project means one folder, in that one folder, one um, one data file, and, and also maybe one script. But, um, you know, oftentimes projects it makes sense to organize them in a in a slightly different way. And this is one of them. And I um, apologize in advance because it's a bit small. And if I if I magnify this, um, it will um, 
it will. What maybe what I could do? Maybe let me try to get clever with this. Let me unshare this for a moment. Let me try to get a little clever with this. Let me share it again, but this time I'm going to share it with the windows. And there we go. Is that better? Is that a little bit bigger for everyone? Hope everybody can see that. Tell me if there's a problem in the chat. <clears throat> but um, I th hopefully, hopefully this is a little bit bigger for you to be able to see the text. And if I just make it even a little bit like that, and I would like you to see the size. Okay, so the thing I want to say about this um, about this folder structure is I'd like to point out that um, it's it's got a project file. I'm just going to clip on click on that. Now I've named the name of the project. Um, you'll notice map dash data dot r proj p r o j, and uh, the name of the folder where the project lives is the same name, map-data. Um, and I've, I've started using for any any um, project that has more than one data file or more than one script, if it makes sense to expand the structure of that, um, I've started exclusively using our projects. I tended to avoid that, and I even still do have to have a good reason to resort to a formal R project because it, it adds a little bit of complication if you haven't used projects before. And because I collaborate a lot, I tend to try to avoid that if I can. But if you have more than one script, it makes sense to, um, to have a project. And um, you'll notice a few folders, almost every one of my projects like this has, uh, has a few folders at minimum that are always the same. One of them is the scripts folder. If I open that, all there is in the scripts folder in this one is just a single file, and it's called data.r. And uh, this, to me, um, serves the function of a, if there's uh, some data handling that is more than 20 lines long, what I can do is I can grab out those 20 lines of data handling and put them in a separate sort of separate um, script file just to organize them out of sight. So then in one single line, I can call and execute this data script and boom, my data will just materialize in my um, in my global environment and it just makes it very tidy. And of course, if we have uh, multiple data files, we'll also want a data folder. So that's another one of the minimum uh, requirements for, you know, going to the going to the trouble of setting up a project. I say trouble, it's extremely easy to set up an R project. But here we can start to see some interesting things. So there are quite a lot of data files in here. I'll explain some of them to you and walk through some of the sources of data for this. This kind of data um, that I'll be showing you today is uh, it's what it's a classic case of what we would call um, what most ecologists would call big data. You know, it's the the data source from which I took these uh, little data files. And by little, um, let's just see what I mean by little. If I pull this out a little bit, the main um, file we're going to be looking at today is this one. It's 192 megabytes of um, data. And, and this is just some animal occurrence data, biodiversity occurrence data from Shropshire. Now I discovered something funny when I was um, working with this, um, is that um, I'll go through this when I introduce the data sources, is that um, historically there is this geographical um, way of describing Shropshire. It's, you know, it's one of the, the home counties, it's got a geographical limit, but um, the two databases that I that I have been exploring um, both treat the geographical definition of of Shropshire differently. One uh, treats it with the geographical historical boundary, and one treats it with the political boundary. And some of you may know that the historical geographical Shropshire contains Harper Adams University. 
but the political boundary does not. <laughs> there's a there's a an invagination uh, in which Harper Adams sits that belongs to Telford and Rican. So um, there are all these weird little things that um, that impact. Uh, spatial data that's just one example but there there are even others that i've encountered in this tiny little project that i'm going to show so in here what you can see is my uh there are nine items some of them are redundant um i've got two zip files that i'm just going to select so you can see them and if i just sort by type um, you can see them both down here these are the source files for the biodiversity records for around Shropshire for um, <clears throat> for uh, these two examples. So if I go back to the main folder, I've got a number of other um, folders in here, which I'm just going to just going to show to you quickly. I have one called eBird test. Um, now, I haven't explained to you the biodiversity project at Harper Adams, and I don't have any slides today, so I'm just going to verbally tell you the concept right now. I was hoping um, I was hoping um, Joe Roberts would be here today because he's involved in one of them. And I'm trying to see anybody else who may be involved in, um, in, in them. But there is an initiative on campus that was uh, instigated by Michael Lee, the um, deputy vice chancellor. And he, uh, he, has instigated a a uh, biodiversity survey as a measure of habitat health and farm practice and you know ultimately the uh, impacts of uh, agriculture activity on the environment by some staff members and and some students and a lot of people on campus are involved in this um, people in crops and and the wildlife um, uh, subjects, myself. Uh, there's a, an undergraduate society that is interested in uh, conservation. It's the Conservation Society that are taking part. And um, this eBird folder is because uh, one of the ways that we have been collecting data, at least it's a way that I have encouraged people to collect data, is with, um, with an app that was developed by um, Cornell University that uh, is a citizen science project. And um, the app doesn't look very much, uh, like very much of itself. If I just um, see if I can get that to, to focus a little bit. It's just a, an app that, um, that records your geographical location and you, you walk around and you literally just uh, record on your phone the birds that you see and hear. And uh, it records the amount of time that you do this activity for and the distance that you walk. If you're moving, you don't have to move. And it it creates a, per, a record of all of the observations. Well, um, some of the, the citizen science data in this database goes to the larger open databases that I've just showed you. In fact, the eBird data it's an international project. I mean, it's it's kind of a big deal. eBird is, uh, and it's been the subject of many uh, ecological and conservation um, scientific articles, and and in really good journals like Science and Nature. Um, so it, it is kind of a big deal in the conservation monitoring world. Um, and I want to use it here on campus. And here's an example of. Um, one record, this is a record that um, was recorded by by me personally, and it was recorded on um, April 22nd. It was recorded at a place, a location that I named called uh, HAU Transect 1, and it, um, it consists of uh, the species that I identified and my count of each of the individuals. And it's geolocated in one um, coordinate. I'm not going to show you the eBird database today, but uh, the reason I'm showing this is um, that these this kind of record, it's very easy to see this because there are only eight 
um, species records, but it's exactly the kind of observation that we'll be mapping in just a moment. Except the database that um, that we'll be using is um, just enormous, even though it, um, oops, I'm not gonna cancel that, don't save, even though it, um, it um, is just a just my own personal record from one time I've used eBird. It was just an experiment, so I want to I want to use um, data that I'll put in this folder to map all of the eBird data that has been taken as part of the the um, Harper Adams Biodiversity Project. And uh, uh, some people are are working, the students and some other staff members are working to collect bird data. And uh, Joe Roberts and myself and some other people are, are going to uh, survey uh, some Lepidoptera species, moths with moth traps. Oh, and Matt as well, who's involved in that. And we'll also map and show the birds. So I'm setting this up for the future. This will be a project that I develop going forward. And um, eventually there'll be a live app that you'll be able to see. So maybe we'll have another meeting in the future showing those developments. Now this folder has um, one of the hard things about spatial data and mapping uh, and, and using it for analysis is is that there are certain conventions with the data. And uh, we don't, um, we can't even really scratch the surface on that. It's a, it's a large subject. There are whole undergraduate and graduate degrees based around basically doing stuff with um, geographical information. And so I, when I started to do this, I wanted to get um, you know, in one sense, I, the way that I just said it makes it sound really complicated and hard, and there's a lot to learn, which I stand by that for sure. But on another level, this kind of data is really simple. It literally is just points on a map that are defined by um, an X and a Y coordinate, latitude and longitude, uh, or some other system, uh, or they are um, shapes. Um, and the shapes themselves are just groupings of points that are joined together by lines to create a polygon. Uh, or another kind of data is called, um, you know, those are called points and or they're sometimes called points and lines or, or sometimes polygons. They are all exactly the same thing. It's just a single point or groups of points. There is another fundamental kind of data called the raster. And that is a, a, an area, could be round, could be hex, could be a square. And uh, it has some value in the raster. Uh, so that might be like um, the, if you were mapping yield or mapping the amount of species, it might be the, the numerical value associated with a particular area for whatever you're measuring. Okay, so when I started to, to put this project together, I, um, I was interested in whether we had any existing data for Harper for the campus. And um, I asked a number of people and everybody said, I think so, but I think this other person has it. And so I went like this um, to the next person. Yeah, I think there's some of that, but I think this other person has it. Yeah, I think there is some and so forth. And I, I made my way to um, Andy Wilcox. Most of you will know Andy. And he teaches uh, one of the geographical information systems. He's a GIS guy. And I asked him, and I thought, well, Andy must have it. I should have asked him first. And he said, well, um, not really, but there are some assets, let's call them. And so he did give me some, some of these. So I have a map of, uh, you know, shape files and geographical information system data are, are famous for um, being complicated and so there are lots of files associated with just the shapes around Harper fields so I have tracked that down I'll, I probably won't get to this part today but there's a little bit of information on hedges which are linear and a little bit on um, point data and where some trees are there's a tree survey the map is um, it is just literally the boundaries of some fields and some maybe even some buildings I think it might just be fields so the, the field map is the only one that I've messed with. Um, what else have I got? Now I have a collection of other assets that are data that are not 
tabular or in a geographical format. And one of them is a um, is a um, survey of bird biodiversity that was done historically in in Harper. Excuse me one moment. I'm just going to close my office door. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we can do a number of things with static maps like exist in these um, these um, PDFs. I'm just going to unshare and, and reshare so you can see what I'm seeing now. There we go. So uh, some of the assets in those PDFs are, are like this. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. And uh, what some of you may recognize is um, some of the bits of Harper Adams. If you're on campus um, today, uh, these are the sports fields. Um, uh, these are the main buildings and um, where the uh, staff car park is. And um, let me see, I, th I think over here somewhere now, this is an old map, but I think this is Agriepi down over here. Anyway. Um, these kinds of assets can either be scanned or they can be converted to um, to traditional maps. So I have these in here again. It's an ongoing project. All right, but let's cut to the chase, and um, I'm just going to open up the um, the main script in R. And uh, before I drag it over, I'm just going to um, purge everything out of out of the memory there. And I'll pull over my R and uh, show you everything. Let me get myself sorted out here. So I'm starting like I like to start with a blank slate in the global environment. <clears throat> I've got the table of contents open, but I'm just going to close that really quick. And I'm going to go to the files. One of the things that is simple about a project, starting a formal R project, is um, that it, it takes care of um, setting your working directory for you. So uh, we know that I have a project open because if I mouse over up in the project drop down, you can see that it's got my map dash data project open. And um, <clears throat> the way if I close this down, uh, close the project, I already had it open and I wanted to show you the process of um, opening a, um, a project. I'm going to not save the state of the project. So uh, I had some other junk here. And um, now we can see that I don't have a project open. And over here in the console, if I say get WD for get working directory, I can see that my default working directory is um, just my, my documents folder on my C drive here. <clears throat> if I go over here and I open up the map project, it opens up a, a different R Studio window, which I'll drag in once it once it fully opens. And uh, it also um, saved some of the things in memory. So I'm just going to close this old one, reopen this, and I just wanted to show you the launching of a um, of a project. So you can see that I have the map dash data project open. I'm going to start from a blank slate, like I like to start. <clears throat> To go to files. Now, if we if we get our working directory, we can see that it is automatically set to the map dash data folder. That's one simplification for map project. But really, the reason to have this is it's just tidy. I can zip this folder up and I could send it to you guys, uh, or you could download it. I will upload this um, uh, a little bit later <clears throat> and and update the um, Herrick page. But you could uh, just unzip this in your own directory and you don't have to fuss around with anything. You'd have all the assets you need to, to uh, reproduce this. So for reproducibility, if you have more than a couple of files, the project is definitely the way to go. Now if I go up here, um, remember how I said that uh, the, um, the, um, the data script does some um, stuff for us? And if we go over to my um, my main script, HAU Biodiversity, 
you can see that it's set up exactly in the way that I like to set up my scripts. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger for you to make it easier to read. I've got a header, I've got a table of contents, and for each of my table of contents items, I have some other sub items. And if we just open up the um, the um, script here and we kind of scroll down a little bit, we can see that um, I only have about uh, about 100 lines of data. And you'll, you'll see it's just a humble map that I've made, but you'll see there's quite a, quite a lot of data and wrangling that goes in behind that map. Let's look in our data folder real quick. And let's just see what we've got here. So I've, I've got about 60, if I don't count the um, commented code, about 30 lines of stuff to uh, read in and wrangle the data. So I've just hidden this out of the way. Remember this um, folder is around 200 megabytes, or this um, data file. So uh, the way we read in the data, let's read in the, um, the libraries. Now today I'm going to show you a, um, a um, <clears throat> map made with the package leaflet. I think it's the easiest way to make a really slick looking map in R, using R as a geographical information system. So I'm going to load in leaflet. I'm going to load in a default um, script in all of my scripts, open XLSX when I'm using Excel files. Um, now, these last two ones are, are quite complicated in a way. They are uh, big packages. They have a lot of dependencies. And they're two of the staple um, libraries for utilities to use R as a geographical information system. I think some people are amazed when they start to get into GIS and R about how well developed it is. On the one hand, it, it has a long history, almost from the beginning of R, lots of tools. You can make amazing maps really easily uh, in, in them. I mean, I'm not going to show you an amazing map today, but I, I hope you'll see how easy it is to make a pretty presentable map with quite a lot of data as well with just a few lines of code once you exploit the power of, of these libraries. So there are whole books written about um, RG Dahl and SF. So the SF package is a full fat suite of, of lots and lots of tools to use on GIS kinds of data. So the shape files, um, those um, particular point um, data point um, data types, and uh, also those rosters. There's also a package called roster that's specifically for that. So let's let's load these. There'll be some warnings and other stuff. One of the things I wanted to show you with the um, warnings for the RG doll package is um, is this that um, one of the dependencies is SP, and and the package right under it is called SF. <clears throat> well, SP was um, a package for many years that has now been superseded by SF. SP standard stood for um, or stands for spatial point, uh, I think. And SF, I can't remember what it um, <laughs> what the uh, F stands for. Maybe some, probably something cutesy. But um, these are the these are the um, this is really the core. Th uh, package that allows us to handle spatial data. We're not even going to handle much spatial data today, but I will show you and alert you to it. Right, so um, <clears throat> I want to show thing about the data sources and uh, say a little bit about this. Maybe you have your own ideas about what you could use data like this for. Um, the data are there and it's just for you to be creative. The first one I'm going to show you is called NBN Atlas. Have, have any of you come across NBN Atlas before? Have you used it before? Maybe drop a Y for yes and an N for no in the chat if you will feed back on that. I thought we'd just peek at a record for an individual species um, in NBN Atlas. <clears throat> now, the NBN Atlas, um, I think it's the National Biodiversity Network Atlas, and it's it's specific to um, Great Britain. Okay, so nobody's used this one before. 
so that's good. See something new. I'm just going to open a tab and I'm going to now I've saved a link and it, it's in the species file uh, folder of species.nbnatlas.org. And uh, furthermore, there's a record that's a code for one particular species. Now, what species have I picked as an example for you? Let's have a look. This is a fantastic little moth called the, the Death's Head Hawk Moth. And um, if I make this um, a little bit smaller so we can just look, we see we have a menu of some stuff up here. We have a map that's interactive. We can zoom uh, in if I click on control. Nope, it doesn't have the active controls, but I can zoom in. And each one of these dots is uh, an individual record. We can see that there are 1,500 records. And uh, as I mentioned, this is um, this is uh, just Great Britain. So um, the likelihood with the density of a species like this um, adhering to political boundaries is, you know, non-existent even on an island. So this moth does, it, as a matter of fact, it does occur um, all over um, all over Europe <clears throat> and in Hollywood. If you've seen the film. What I want to show you is um, a little bit about uh, what what kind of public data uh, there are in in this. You can search for species, and this is quite a large website. It's not particularly user friendly, but it is easy to use. It's just there's a lot to it. So I want to look at the gallery. Um, this one, the way the MBN Atlas, their philosophy is. Um, that they control a lot of things about the data. It is open access to an extent, but they do control a lot of aspects of the data. And one aspect that they control, probably for practical reasons, is the number of pictures that they have. So uh, they only have one picture for this species. The names, they have a taxonomy, and uh, the the uh, they adhere to the United Kingdom common names um, taxonomy, but they have uh, Welsh variants and other variants of common names if they exist. They have a uh, another uh, a standard taxonomy. I don't know which one. Maybe it is a UK based standard um, phylogenetic um, definition of the species. They have um, a summary of the records for this species, and this is just a count of um, of uh, each time that uh, spatial features. Thank you, uh, Herman. <clears throat> uh, so th this is all the um, counties. These are the Watsonian vice counties and the counts of records for each. So in East Norfolk, um, we have, it looks like around 160 records of sightings for this. And of course, this will be over some years. We don't have time on this particular one. There are a couple of little uh, interactive tabs up here. Um, we can view a list of all of the occurrence records. And I should say that um, this kind of data is, is referred to as occurrence data. So there'll be um, one row in tidy data format. This is quite a slow website. Let's just give it a second. There'll be one row per, um, per occurrence. And uh, this is a, a little snapshot. Each of these little rows is a snapshot of one of the um, one of the records. So let's view one of the records. OK, so uh, <clears throat> now for the record, they, they put the X, Y coordinate on the map. So that's just the first one we did. They've got a date. This one was in August last year. Locality. Um, most of you may know that the um, the UK is kind of uh, has a unique system for storing spatial um, ecological data. It's the national grid. You guys aware of the national grid? It um, it extends uh, like the empire, the old empire extends uh, from the center of Great Britain outward around the whole world. And uh, there are different versions of the grid. So the, I think that the largest one is 100 kilometers. And then Within that, there are each 100 kilometer one, there are, are um, uh, 110 kilometers 
in an inner grid and within each 10 kilometer national grid, there are 101 kilometer um, grid references. So um, when we have the location, the grid reference has got the, the big old grid and then the inner grid from the big old grid and then the smallest grid within the inner grid. <laughs> And they also give us latitude and longitude, and this is um, also on. Uh, this is probably on the UK um, um, coordinate reference system or CRS. So there are lots of different coordinates reference systems that account for the curvature of the Earth, geographical space. But I digress. Let's forget all of that for now. So uh, if we go down here, we can see um, where the data came from. So this is part of a, a local um, data group and this local Highland Biological Recording Group has contributed their data to another group um, called the HBRG and I guess that's the name of their group, Insects Database. So these are groupings to uh, identify the location of the data. There's a collection code, now that's probably a collection code associated with that, that Insects data set. Um, They've got an individual count of this occurrence. There are one or two, which is an estimate. So they may maybe they saw one and they estimated they didn't didn't see all of them that were there. It's a common thing to do in ecological monitoring. And if we just keep scrolling, I'm not going to go through all of these. There's quite a lot of data here. And you can imagine if this is just one record, just one row on the data sh data uh, sheet, you can imagine if we got a lot of records, that each one of these fields is a column in the in the data sheet. So let's go back to R real quick. That's just a little taste. I mean, there's a lot to the NBN Atlas. Um, I, I should say the thing I like about the NBN Atlas is that it's very detailed. Did anyone notice how many records there were for that species in the database? Did anyone notice that when I first went to the landing page? Okay, so there were about 1500 records there. So let's compare that to the same species uh, in the GBIF. The GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information something. I don't think it's features, but it's something. Uh, maybe foundation. <clears throat> Let's just copy this and go to this database. Now, the thing that I, I don't love about the NBN Atlas, uh, even though I like that it is um, picked to Great Britain and I like the the idiosyncrasies that that entails, the thing I don't like about it is they they constrain some aspects of the data, like the pictures that come with it. They also constrain you in the amount of the data that you're allowed to uh, download all at once. So uh, they do allow you to um, to download, um, I think it's something like 100,000 records, is which are allowed, but also you have to ask for permission. And I, I think it's very likely that if you wanted to download all the data, that they would just say no. And I think it was it would be likely also if you you said, listen, I want to teach or do some research on 100,000 records, they would say no problem. And, but what if you wanted a million records? Well, if you ask for 100,000 a few times, uh, I, I suspect that they would say no, or they would want you to pay for it after a little while. So that's the thing that I don't love about Ambient Atlas. It's a bit of a faff to get data that you wanted. And um, I actually was not able to download uh, all the biodiversity data in a 20 kilometer squared region uh, around Harper Adams. Uh, it, it hit the, the limit of their, of their um, allowance for me. And they had an automated process that allowed me to download the first 100,000 or whatever the limit is. And uh, then when I went for a second request to get the rest of the 20 kilometers, it's an arbitrary 20 kilometer radius around Harper that I wanted. Um, it said, hold on, you've just done 100. You have to you have to send a special request. And I sent the request on about, a, about a, um, two weeks ago, I guess, or three weeks ago. And I never have received a reply. I, I checked again just today. 
So um, GBIF doesn't have those kinds of constraints. Um, you can download much larger data sets if you want. It's a global database. It's funded. It's well funded by a lot of research organizations and universities. Uh, and it's it's a better website. It's fat by which I mean it's much faster and it's a little bit slicker. They don't have constraints on um, things like the the pictures. Um, now here. We have um, uh, w where there were about 1,500 ones in uh, in Bean Atlas here, and you know keep in mind that this is a, a widespread species. We have the global records stretching down to South Africa and over into um, even all the way to Asia, but it's concentrated in Europe, isn't it? And uh, here there are 1,800 occurrences just with images, and overall there are uh, almost 9,000 records. So it's just a larger database. The context is bigger. It's another thing I like. I also like that they have lots of different images of different life stages. Um, it's just nice. So um, we can look around in this, but I'm not going to take any more time to do that. If we just peek at the occurrences, I don't if you noticed how fast that was as opposed to having to wait, it's it's not very much, but um, <clears throat> we're not going to look at all of the records, but if we just um, look at some of them, we have the county, the coordinates, they have Latin Lange uh, further down, and there are about 100 fields here. Um, you know, what kind of record it is, wh where it came from. This one came from the, the app iNaturalist. So again, this is citizen science data. <clears throat> All right, so that just gives you a taste. So um, I'm going to read in the data now. And uh, the data I'm going to read in, when I call this line, it's going to run all of the code in my data file. <clears throat> and uh, so let's first look in the data file real quick. I've got the um, latitude and longitude of the center of Harper Adams campus that I'm just going to define as uh, some spatial points to exploit. I'm going to, um, in this case, I'm going to read in the NBN Atlas records um, <clears throat> for Harper Adams. I'm going to convert this, this terrible name with special characters that comes in the default data, and I'm just going to make some new data points that are just nice and short names, Latin long. I'm also going to pull out a couple of um, taxa that I'm interested in. So, um, if we, uh, when I read this in, I'll explore this a little bit with you, but there's a um, taxonomic class um, column, and aves are birds, insecta are insects, of course, arachnida are spiders, and it's spider kin, mammals, and lepidoptera. So I'm just making, um, when I use the which function, I'm just pulling out the number of the row index that contain records where class is equivalent to these strings. Um, and then we can manipulate these classes in the script, which we'll do. Another thing that I've created here is um, for the bird index, I'm interested in um, a class, uh, a category of species that are associated with farmland in the UK that are bioindicators of um, anthropogenic impact. So these are the so-called farmland bird indicators. Um, and there are species like um, the, uh, you know, the, you might be familiar with, like lapwing that uh, nest on the ground and uh, get disturbed, uh, especially with intensive agriculture year round, as opposed to 50 years ago when the fields were let lay over the winter. Linnet. <clears throat> so seed specialist that has been lapwing or declining, by the way, in case you didn't know, probably because of the intensification of um, overwinter agriculture activity. Linnet is a species that um, is a seed specialist and also been declining for years. And um, it uh, probably is declining because of um, uh, there used to be um, seed crops that were left in fallow fields over certain uh, seasons. But then on the other hand, we have um, species like the wood pigeon. You know, probably if you guys are on campus, 
it wouldn't be out out of the question for you to be able to hear a wood pigeon in the next 30 seconds they're they're really have benefited from agriculture activity but also jackdaws all over campus and uh <clears throat> and of course if you go stroll around the front of the vice chancellor's office you can't miss the rooks that are that are set up in the rookery there so there are some winners and losers uh, here, and I'm just going to define those in a vector that we can exploit to map them, map ones that we want. We've got a utility to convert um, latitude and longitude degrees to geographical distances. Um, and I've got some other stuff that I've just left in there for fun. So let's read in our 200 meg folder. How long is that going to take? Well, let's see. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to um, load in my little um, little library <clears throat> It'll measure the time for us let's just load this up and see how long that takes so we can see it thinking and it's still reading so i have a um, solid state hard drive and lots of ram and a very very fast processor on my home computer here it's still taking quite a long time to read. Tabular data is very inefficient to read. And this is kind of a wide, long file. So let's see how long it takes. I think it takes about 20 seconds. So let's see. You get used to reading in small files with 35 seconds. All right, now what has popped up up in the global environment? So we have our current data set. It's, um, it's uh, 273,000 observations of 58 variables. OK, and um, birds is just our string of um, of um, integers that are the row numbers where the AVE class AVE um, uh, occurrence records are. And uh, it's it's in its own column here. You can see there are 210,000 um, bird observations out of 273. Probably the reason for that is in NBN Atlas is they use that um, one of the data sources is the British Trust for Ornithology's garden bird count. And they also have eBird data and, and iNaturalist bird data. So they have quite a lot of citizen science and birds are popular for people to watch because they're so probably because they're so pretty and interesting, but also because um, they're very easy to watch. They're loud and they're brightly colored and they move a lot. OK, so historically birds have been the most popular and the most well monitored of any species. So also got the other things that I, I set aside um, the indices for all of those other things. So let's just look at the shape of the data real quick before I make the map. I've just gone on this whole time and we're already out of time. So this is the length of a the length of a table of all of our records for the start year for the um, occurrence record. And there are 158 years in this data set just around 20, 20 kilometers around Harper Adams. And if we sort um, the, uh, the years, we can just look at those 158 years. So there are some 2022 data already in those, not very much. The first record is 1629. Is that surprising to you? We know that. Um, I think there are some very old villages. The village that I live closest to, Market Drayton, is in the Doomsday Book. There's been an active market there since uh, since around that year. So we have the first records there. We could see what they are if we wanted to, but I won't take the time just now. How many bird species are there? So here's a table of the occurrence records of the common names for my bird subset. And I'm just asking what the length of that unique table is. So how many bird species are in there? How many do you think are in there? How many bird species are in Britain? Test yourself mentally. But here comes the answer. Three, two, one. Down on the console. 234 records. I'm going to ask exactly the same question for how many families there are. How many bird families are there in Britain? You have an idea? Three, two, one. 56 in this data set just around um, Harper. How many bird families are there in the world? or bird species in the world. Does anybody know? Somebody know how many bird species there are? Put it in the chat. Now, here's my farm bird indicators. <clears throat> um, 
so we have those species and I can just grab them by the index. Um, these are all occurrences. I think I've made a little plot of um, 800. That's a good guess. I think that that's a, that would be a good guess that there's probably not that many bird species in Britain, uh, even ones that just migrate through and are very rare. But that is a very good guess. That's a good guess. Order of magnitude too few for how many species of birds there are in the world, though. So let's look at the all occurrences. Um, this is just boop. This is a number of um, the number of observations through time between the year um, 1980 and 2022. So I've set the limit um, there. Uh, it looks like we have a little extra dot there. I'm not going to linger and figure out why. And this is all the records. Note the um, the length of the x-axis here. We're close to 20,000. And now keep your eye on the plot. And I'm going to plot again just the um, just the um, the um, bird records. Look at the x-axis when I do this. Three, two, one. Now the shape of this plot is almost identical. And what that suggests to me is that um, the the averages of every one of those dots, or most of them, have just come down a little bit. And what this tells me, what it suggests to me, is that the bulk of all the data for our little data grab are driven by the birds. Of course, we already knew that because it was 80% um, of the records are birds. Let's have a look at the um, distribution of the families. I think this is a pretty bad plot, but just to give an idea, I wanted to explore this myself. Again, there are, there are 56 families that I'm going to do, and here's a vertical bar plot of the families. They don't all fit on here. I made the ones, the few families big enough for us to read. But what we can do is we can um, we can put our why don't we print out this um, table we can see what the big families are. I know the corvids are up here because we can read that one, but it looks like there are a few families above that. Three, two, one. So here are 56 bird families and arranged as a table and some of the counts and I've sorted it. So anatidae. Now I think the anatidae are the, um, they're geese or ducks. I can't remember which. And uh, fringillidae. I cannot remember what those are. There's the corvids. So there are three families um, um, above that. Turdidae are um, starlings and uh, and relatives, blackbirds. Okay, so uh, we're getting an idea of the shape of the data, but let's get onto the map because I've uh, just rambled on this whole time and we're out of time. Let's remind ourselves of the um, the FBI farm bird indicators. And uh, I've set some uh, aesthetics. Now I could do this over in the data um, tab, but uh, I like to do it here right before I make a map so that I can fiddle with it. <clears throat> if I were to make an, a shiny app, um, it would be important to get this part right for, um, for how it looks. So I'm just gonna load those up. The rad is the radius, the size of the, some dots that I might make. The opacity is um, how opaque one being fully opaque. I've set up a palette, um, and I like uh, the R Color Brewer palettes. And I happen to know that set one is colorblind friendly, and these are the colors for my palette. You'll see a few of them. They're just um, like minty, cool colors that colorblind folks can also see. Um, I've got these that I set up in one version of the map, but we won't use those today. And they're a dispersion factor for for um, dots that are right in the same latitude and longitude. The way eBird and a lot of these apps work is if there's a hot spot like a lake uh, or a spot of interest, they will aggregate all the occurrence records on one geographical location. So if you're at Harper, um, it it might make a distinction between. Um, one side of the the road in front of Harper and the other, but it might not make a distinction for spots that are, you know, a few hundred meters apart on the ground. So I have these in here to to 
visually separate those dots with a random dispersion factor. OK, so I'm going to set my subset to FBI one. Let's just remind ourselves what that is. It's the tree sparrow. Let's let's set it to um, set it to the lap wing. So that's that's eight. So I'm going to set it to FBI eight. That should be lap wing. And then what I'm going to do, this is the second version. I'm not showing you the first version. Maybe we'll get to it if, if we have it, but we're already out of time. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm using leaflet on my occurrence data set to that subset for lapwing. So it's going to pull out the rows where um, I've set the, um, the, oh, you know, this is actually a mistake. Let's see what this does to you. <laughs> But I don't think this is actually quite right. I was doing this quite quickly before um, before the meeting. Let's see what this does to you. Let's just go ahead and do it, and then we'll we'll fix it together. Yeah, I think so. Data clean one row. So what? Yeah, what I need to do is I need to wrap um, the occurrence data in my subset for common name. Common name. And then I need my subset. It needs the common name needs to be um, equivalent to my subset. So my subset is lap wing. Oops. Boom. Boom. There we go. So maybe it didn't like that. Let me just try that real quick. We'll fix it. Yeah, it didn't like that because um, so it's made my map. But let's fix this little bit. We need to set this common name, occurrence, and in there we need common name, common name, sub, which. That's what I get for um, coding and changing my mind right before a meeting. So let's just make sure that this comes up with some records. So here I'm just asking it for uh, which occurrence common name is equivalent to lapwing. It loads numbers and we do, and then I'm setting that as the row numbers within the occurrence database. So I'm gonna need to um, take this whole little thing, copy and recycle it down here for the lat and the launch. There we go. That should do it. Let's just try that. OK, so this is going to take the leaflet and it's going to put it into a map object. Now, leaflet is going to take all of these, these records and count them. And then I'm going to add the background tiles. So that's the uh, background map. I'm going to set the view of that map based on my um, Harper Adams uh, locations, the Latin Lounge, and I can set the zoom level. Then I'm going to pipe that to adding some markers. And here I'm going to add circle markers, which are aesthetically pleasing count numbers. And I'm going to add the markers at the Latin Long that I want. Um, there won't be any stroke symbols with it. And um, this cluster options allows you either to, to um, plot your points all as independent X and Ys or cluster them together and aggregate them with a number indicating it. So um, I think this will all go like that. And it does. And then let's, let's add a scale bar. And there we go. So what are we looking at here? So if we um, if we look at this, here's the main campus. And if remember, I've done a subset of lap wing. And uh, if I mouse over, this is an interactive map. If I mouse over this 16, there have been 16 occurrence records of lap wing. And if I mouse over it, what it, this triangle indicates is that they're it's aggregated in space because they're close together and it's just done it by the default settings. It's counted all 16. We can't actually click on it. 
And it turns out that there are some different locations. So there have been lapwings. This is a field over just beyond the engineers. And there have been four over here and three over here right on campus by the sports fields. So um, and we can it's fully interactive for the area that I've got. And you can see that it's just a little area around Shropshire. OK, now let's look at a few other species here. Let's interact with this map. So this is what a shiny app might have a drop down menu and uh, we can set our species to uh, in this case we're going to set it to tree sparrow. So uh, let's see if we scroll in. I think this will redraw the map and recenter it so I don't have to mess about with it. So if I reset that, make my new map. And so these are um, tree sparrows. We have quite a lot of them around campus. So it must have been a whole colony and they were all viewed at that direction, uh, at that location rather. Let's set this one. Let's see if we can see the value of my, F, my sub. Corn bunting, so I can see it right there when I set it. So corn bunting, boom, boom. We can set to, oops, it's not going to let me do that every time. And we can just scroll through some of the, um, some of the species. So an interactive map. I thought that this didn't work for a second, but I see one down here. And if we scroll out, the, um, Corn bunting is, or the turtle dove rather, is rare. Yeah, I've never seen a turtle dove or heard one on campus. So we, in the whole county, uh, in all of those records, they're not those. Let's try to do one last ambitious thing. We're out of time. We're over time a little bit. But if you want to see how easy it is to do it, remember I made those um, those records for um, for other birds or for other taxonomic groups. Now I can make um, a map. I want to try to make a map for one of these groups. So somebody suggests a group that they would like to see all together in the chat. I will map that as a as a last hurrah. I might take a moment for the map to render. Anybody interested in spiders, insects, birds? Who wants to see what? Anybody have a suggestion? Fox spiders. OK, we could get Fox out of there, but I don't have the code code ready. We'll do spiders and leps since I've already got those and I want to see the leps myself. So um, the first thing we'll do is we'll um, I'm going to set sub to um, spiders. I like spiders too. Uh, we're going to set our sub to spiders and then uh, let me see what do we have to do here? So here we're going to need to change this code just a little bit. And we're going to have to the sub now. I think that is, let me see, spiders. Have I misspelled that? Spiders, which occurrence class equals arachnida? Oh, arach, did I misspell arachnida? I think I did. There we go. Spiders, let me save. Come over here, spiders. Now I've got sub, I've got my numbers, my indices. Now I think we just need to um, change this to sub. I think that is it. Copy, current data, common names. So now, are there, I know that there are some spider recorders in our county here. But let's have a look now something it doesn't like something let's find out where i've made a mistake here somewhere See what i've done need to put that back boom boom now let's see if it likes me again now it likes me again okay here come the spiders first three two one Okay, hey, we need a serious increase in the spider recording activity around Harper's campus. Look at that. There haven't been not that many spider records. 
So 10 spider records, um, 22 in Edgemond and three, gosh, who's been recording spiders up here on the farm? I believe that's in the farm. Okay, so that's a little surprising. So if anybody wants to make an impact on the state of spider records in Shropshire for the campus, it's a big opportunity because you, you've got a low hanging fruit. You can double it and bring home the glory for doing that. Okay, let's do leps. Now there are quite a few leps, I think. Let's see what the sub. So there's um, 22,000 leps, and I hope some of them are um, from staff and students. This takes a moment to render. There we go. So um, they're recorded all over campus. And look at that in Edgeman. There must be some authors in Edgeman. Maybe some of our friends and colleagues. Maybe, dare I say, some of our students. Okay, guys, we're over time. Sorry about that. Uh, I do have some more script, <laughs> but what I hope to do next is um, I'm going to convert this straight away into a, um, a shiny app, and I will. Uh, I'm going to do it in the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this before we have another meeting on it. But if you want to see how I convert this and add some value, what I want to do is um, over time create some species accumulation curves for birds on campus and some ways to um, explore species richness of uh, different taxa, include, definitely including leps and uh, the birds on campus, um, maybe some other groups as well on a shiny app. So I'll do that in the future. Hope that was interesting. It's just scratching the surface um, of all the stuff you can do. I'm having fun uh, exploring what you can do with uh, with leaflet as so I haven't used it at all before and it is so easy and maybe the very last thing I'll I'll do as a parting thing one more minute is um, this add provider tiles is a way to add uh, layers to your maps maybe the birds did eat all the spiders <laughs> um, this is uh, this Esri is the company that makes ArcView and uh, with this add provider tiles with the leaflet system you can um, you can add default providers and if I add satellite imagery of Harper three two one so I'm taking my existing map and I'm pushing it onto a add provider tiles three two one and we can just update it with some satellite imagery and I, I think actually what I what I want to do for this map to improve the quality of the map is to um, is to overlay the shape of the fields. And we're we're collecting some surveys on eight transects around campus. And as a matter of fact, um, I did mention it last time that we'll have a, a bird morning, just walking around using eBird to record. And you don't have to know anything about birds to participate. So if any of you would like to come, I'll even tell you the date right now. Uh, you don't even have to have. Um, Binoculars, we can lend you some binoculars, and the date is, let us see, 6, 6 a.m. on, do I have it on my map? Well, I don't have it on my, um, yes, I do. It's Tuesday, May 3rd at 6 a.m. I'll remind you again if you want to come out and contribute to the Atlas or maybe you want to focus on an underappreciated group, the spiders. I'll see you guys. I'll upload uh, this code and uh, I'll have a GitHub repository shortly if you're interested in playing with this. It's so easy to uh, drop your own data into it. You've got to give it a go. I'll talk to you later. I'm going to just... Stop the video. Should have already stopped that because I've been rambling for.